Sir Arvind Datar to share his views on the topic. Honorable Justice Nageshwar Rao, Honorable Justice Lalit, Justice Gavai, Justice Roy, distinguished Chief Justice of various high courts, my young friends, respected Attorney General. I must thank Justice Rao for giving me this opportunity of speaking on this Constitution Day. It is indeed a privilege to address so many eminent judges. And I'm particularly happy that I'm sharing the dais with our respected Attorney General. We come from the same High Court. And it is perhaps a legacy of the Constitution that the Attorney General's family came from Kerala to Madras. My family came from Maharashtra. We both enrolled in the Madras High Court. And now we practice in the Supreme Court before judges and lawyers from all parts of the country. This is the rich legacy that our Constitution has really given us, and we unfortunately take it for granted. Now, the topic is perspectives and vision, so I've divided my talk in perspectives and vision. Looking back to the Constituent Assembly, I think in retrospect, the decision of having a detailed Constitution was absolutely justified. In the various speeches of the Constituent Assembly, it is my personal opinion that the most important speech is the speech of Ambedkar on 4th November 1948. It is as important as the 26th November 1948. Sorry, 4th, yes, 4th November 1949. He said, when the final draft was presented, it was bitterly criticized as having 315 articles and 8 schedules. And in that speech, Dr. Ambedkar justifies why he has a detailed constitution. And I would tell all my young friends, we get a chance, this speech runs into nine pages. And it justifies various parts of the constitution, what are the problems of India, why, he, why the draft constitution has so many articles, schedules, and so on and so forth. And it's in this speech that he uses the word constitutional morality. Of course, he uses it in the sense used by Professor Dicey, which means constitutional conventions in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And of course, now this expression constitutional morality will now come before the seven judges in the Shabrimala case. But in a sense, the drafting of a large constitution has stood the test of time. And Dr. Ambedkar admits that he has no qualms, no regrets of founding this constitution on the Government of India Act 1935. He said there's no difficulty in borrowing something which has worked. It's a brilliant speech and definitely worth reading. In a sense, the India's constitutional journey began with writ petition number 13 of 1950, which is also known as the A.K. Gopalan's case. In fact, one of the things I would request Justice Lalit and other judges, what was writ petition number 1 of 1950 in the Supreme Court? I still don't know. And what are the first 12 writ petitions? <laughs> A.K. Gopalan is WP 13 of 1950. It was argued by Sri A.K. Gopalan's father, M.K. Nambiar. And if you read the judgment, particularly the dissent of Fazal Ali, one can realize the amount of scholarship, the amount of hard work that has gone into this case, and the analysis by all the judges, both for and against, on the nature of life, liberty, fundamental rights, and so on. Due to shortage of time, I'm not going to get into details. But it has been a very exciting journey for this, for our country. In the last 70 years, we've had as many as 2,160 five judge bench judgments interpreting the constitution. In the beginning, we had ma matters of property rights, and Mr. Venugopal mentioned about the courts interfering. That, in my humble submission, is not correct. A large part of the litigation could have been avoided if they had paid some reasonable compensation. The bank nationalization case was struck down. Actually, bank nationalization, Mr. Sorabji told me, they had lost everything. Everything was upheld, the power to nationalize all that. The only ground on which it was struck down was the quantum of compensation paid to these 14 banks. The compensation was to be paid in 10-year bonds. <coughs> the valuation of property was on the rent rental value. So they got a farthing. And what was worse was these bonds were payable after 10 years. That was the ultimate ground and it was struck down. Ultimately, the government paid 54 crores more to 14 banks. 14 banks got just 54 crores more and they were nationalized and upheld. So all this litigation could have been substantially avoided if we had gone into reasonable compensation. And those of you interested, there's a lovely book on the First Amendment called 16 Stormy Days by Tripur Damandas, 
and he gives how in 16 days the first amendment was uh, prepared and in fact one more claim from the madras high court our former advocate general vk trivingadachari who mr venugopal has appeared before he suggested the ninth schedule which is perhaps unique in any constitution you have got a constitutional provision which says you can't challenge this part in the constitution itself so that's a very unique provision but that was suggested by mr vk tichari finally when we came to the question of basic structure i would again request my young friends that the seeds of this basic structure the doubt as to whether the power under article 368 is untrammeled is it uncontrolled can be traced not so much to dieter conrad but to the dissenting opinions of hidayatullah and mudholkar in the sajjan singh case of 65 supreme court it's a especially just as mudholkar's judgment is absolutely stunning and it is remarkable that the theory of essential features is derived from a judgment of chief justice cornelius of the pakistan supreme court and hidayat ali uses the word he says that you can amend part 3 by a simple majority hidayatullah says that our fundamental rights the playthings of the majority mudholkar says are these essential values can be simply taken away by majority and thereby 3 is to 2 they uphold 368 but for the first time doubts are created of course we go to kesan bharati then we go to golaknath and then to kesan bharati and so on nevertheless as far as kesan bharati is concerned it created it ensured that the core of the constitution is impregnable and these basic values cannot be touched and once again to my mind one of the finest pieces of a judgment is the dissent of hr khanna and i would honestly request the young students to see the last 34 35 paragraphs where justice khanna defends the action though all rights are taken away there is no judicial review yet in a masterly discussion starting from the magna carta he discusses how even in the direst of circumstances rule of law prevails and the rights of a person cannot be taken away it's a absolutely brilliant judgment justice khanna's dissent now this is as far as the uh, history is concerned we must also compliment the supreme court not only on basic structure but on a recent judgment on the right to privacy where right to privacy has been read into part 3 of the constitution in all its parts these are fascinating aspects of judicial creativity for which the supreme court deserves to be complimented now let me come to the vision part because i'm running out of time i personally feel that there are two three amendments which may be necessary as far as the constitution is concerned i'm putting forth my thoughts we're going to have comments and question answers afterwards one point which i would like to mention is that there must be time limits in the constitution take for example article 254 2 if a state legislation a bill passed by a state assembly is on a collision or is contrary to a, uh, a central enactment then it can get the presidential assent and it will be applicable in that state now there is no time limit for the president to grant consent i checked the my state the from tamil nadu assembly bills from 2014 are still pending for clearance now what is the power of my i can't use my powers under article 246 read with list 3 if the bill i pass still cannot become law because lack of presidential assent so this is one point where i felt we could have perhaps a small tweaking a, an amendment could be made that any uh, presidential assent should be given in a certain amount of time or it will be deemed to be granted similarly other parts of the constitution like presidential pardon governor's pardon etc there are a number of provisions in the constitution where there is no time limit in fact even for judicial appointments we filed a pil it's pending that there should be some kind of time limit for each stage of the process the second part of the constitution which requires change is the need for debate while passing important bills sadly if you read the report of prs many important bills are rushed through parliament without any discussion at all now can it be challenged that there was no discussion in a superb judgment of the israeli supreme court Kwetinski versus the Knesset the Supreme Court of Israel struck down a tax bill because it was introduced just 48 hours and passed within 2 days without any discussion and the Israeli Supreme Court says a part of constitutional democracy is the right of every legislature legislator to participate in the rule making process and if legislators are not given the power to participate the bill was the act was set aside 
and it was sent back for deliberation and discussion. Now, this Israeli Supreme Court was picked up in Colombia, and the Colombian Supreme Court has now said that there must be minimum deliberation before any act is passed. So I would suggest that there could be an amendment in Article 107 and Article 118 mandating that there should be debate discussions in Parliament. I have had the opportunity of giving evidence before parliamentary committees. In fact, the Tribunal's Uniform Conditions Bill, we were able to show that it is an unworkable bill and it was dropped. In another bill, I had the opportunity or privilege of facing a committee involving late Dr. P.C. Alexander and Ram Jaitpalani and for 20 minutes they grilled me on various parts of the submissions we made. So these are parliamentary committees where debates and discussions help. Now this is as far as the constitutional provisions are concerned. Now as the next part is the most important thing, access to justice, justice delivery system. Ultimately the rule of law is meaningless if the access to justice is, is just a mirage. I personally, uh, with great respect, I beg to disagree with uh, Attorney General on the National Court of Appeal. I do not think that it is a workable idea, it is my humble submission. It is better that we have a permanent constitution bench in the Supreme Court and it is necessary to see whether amendments can be made so that every case does not reach the Supreme Court. For example, a 482 order, it could be subject to an intra-court appeal, why should it come straight? An order in section 115 CPC, why should it come straight to the Supreme Court? There could be an intra-court appeal, that is also a possibility. Secondly, one danger I find while dealing with various matters is that we are quick to create institutions, but after delivering the baby, there is very little work done to nurture it and put it on its feet. Take for example the Consumer Courts Act, I was just talking to my friend. In throughout the country, vacancies are pending across and cases are getting delayed. Ironically, he was telling me that in the Consumer Courts Act, the matter has to be disposed of in 90 days. But last week, they gave an adjournment, post the case after 9 months because there is no time. If the entire case has to be finished in 90 days, what is the point in giving an adjournment of 9 months? The case is pending from 2004. The same is the system of the tribunals. And I think it is time when we talk of vision. What is our national vision of a justice delivery system? What part is to be taken up by the courts? What parts are to be taken up by the tribunals? If there are tribunals, how are they to function? Who are to man them? What is the tenure? So this ad hocism of having a knee-jerk reaction to a problem has to stop and I personally feel that we should have a national vision of what can be taken up by tribunals. Ultimately, what are you doing? Even a tribunal is deciding cases. You are outsourcing factual disputes, expert disputes to, to a quasi-judicial body and retaining the power to decide questions of law. Fortunately, in the National Tax Tribunal case, again the Madras Bar Association, we were, the Supreme Court was pleased to hold that decisions on what constitutes a substantial question of law, decisions on substantial questions of law is a core judicial function. It can never go to the tribunals. So now we have a system where the courts will be confined to deciding questions of law and tribunals on facts. So this is one more thing which we have to decide. The third point I want to mention is this cutting down the inputs to the courts. In Madras, 40,000 writ petitions are filed every year. In Madurai Bain, there are 30,000 writ petitions. Most of them are simple mandamus. Many of them need not reach the court at all. In income tax, from January, you have a flurry of reopening assessments. 40% of the litigation is on reopening assessments. If you don't reopen assessments, as per Supreme Court judgments, almost 60% of litigation is bound to end. So one also, we should see how the inputs to the courts can be reduced, rather than thinking of another national court and disrupting the existing system. We can use the tools of systems thinking, design thinking, lateral thinking and see how the existing system itself can be made to work without any major structural changes. Finally, I would also mention that the, in the days to come, the aspect of procedural due process will have to take center stage. There is no point talking of life, liberty, that life is not just a mere ex existence. If your very liberty is subject to so many conditions that bail becomes the rule and jail becomes, that bail becomes the exception and jail becomes the rule. So on issues of personal liberty also, we really have to now see whether procedural obstacles, procedural hurdles violate Article 21. So these are the points which I think immediately require attention. And finally, I'll mention that 
while we think of courts in UK, US, Canada, very important developments are taking place in courts which we don't normally think of. I mentioned the case of Potinsky versus the Knesset in Israel. In my, while working on my book, I've been coming across various blogs. Israel is a very, very important jurisdiction with a number of interesting thinking, and not just by Aran Barak. You have uh, Raznov, you have Rubinstein, all these people, scholars are doing excellent work. But I'll just mention two cases and I'll end. I was very surprised and delighted to read a judgment from Mauritius, which was upheld by the Privy Council. It's called R versus Abdul Khoirati. What was this case? Section 1 of the Mauritius constitution, they don't call it article, they call it section 1, says Mauritius is a republic governed by rule of law, that's all. The Mauritius parliament made a Drug Offenders Act which said that the judiciary has no power to grant bail in drug cases and they also amended the constitution saying the courts will not grant bail. Now the Mauritius Supreme Court struck this down, struck the constitutional amendment down and said that the right, the decision to grant or not grant bail is a core judicial function. It can never be taken away. The only step under the Mauritius constitution is if they want to take it away, pre council held. Mauritius constitution contemplates if you want to alter the basic features, you have to go for a referendum of three-fourths of the Mauritius population. So they said short of that, you simply cannot take away the power to grant bail. That is a core judicial power. And very interestingly, they refer to a judgment of Lord Bingham in Mollison's case where he says, it's a very interesting point, we talk of separation of powers. He says they can be overlapping between executive and legislature, but there can be no overlapping with judicial powers. They are on a standalone basis and they cannot be touched. That's a very remarkable point made by the Privy Council in the Mauritius case. And I'll just mention the last case, Kenya. Katiba Institute versus the President of Kenya. It just came six weeks ago, four weeks ago. Kenya has a Judicial Service Commission. They recommended 41 names to be appointed. The President appointed 30, uh, 35 but did not appoint six. So Katiba Institute is a NGO, they filed a writ petition. In a remarkable 60-page judgment, three judges of the Constitutional Division of the High Court of Kenya said that the President has no power. They issued a mandamus to the President saying, once the Judicial Service Commission appoints the judges, you have to appoint it. And after saying you shall appoint, Para B says, if the President doesn't appoint, they shall be deemed to be appointed. It is now pending in the Supreme Court, but I'm just trying to mention that whether Israel or uh, Mauritius or uh, Kenya, very, very interesting developments are taking place. Incidentally, you'll know that Kenyan Supreme Court followed Kesan Bharati and adopted basic structure last year. So with that, I'll just come to an end. I'll just mention that I think whatever said and done, I'm very optimistic. There are very, very promising days ahead. It is a 70-year-old constitution has now to be used to interpret the digital age. We have the pluses and minuses of social media. We have boundaryless things where what is said here can be seen in any part of the world in seconds. But I'm sure that we will definitely meet the challenges. It's not only the judges, but even the lawyers have a responsibility of placing all the materials before the judges for them to get a just decision. And I'll just conclude that yesterday, uh, Chief Justice Ramana rightly drew attention of uh, all of us to fundamental duties. This is part 4A of the Constitution, which we hardly see. In my humble opinion, this part 4A fundamental duties was introduced on the basis of the Swaran Singh recommendations. And it is the only silver lining to this outrageous 42nd Amendment. And Clause A of this 51A says that we should all abide by and respect the ideals of our constitution. I think that it is no point just asking the judiciary or the executive. All of us also have a duty. And I will just conclude by paraphrasing John Kennedy by saying that, ask not what the constitution can do for you. Ask what all of us can do to respect and protect the constitution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Datar, for a very informative speech and for uh, thought-provoking uh, views that are uh, shared by you. We are uh, 
already five minutes past uh, the deadline that is given to us. But as Mr. Venugopal says, 1.42, we will uh, extend by another <laughs> five to ten minutes. <laughs> Quest, any, any, any questions or uh, comments? Yes, Murlida. judicial impact assessment. Every time there is a new law, every time there is a change in the manner of dealing with issues, like for instance Chandra Kumar. One decision of Chandra Kumar meant that all the high courts would have judicial review power over the decisions of the tribunals. And that is without an amendment to a statute, but it is an impact on the judiciary. Likewise, we have various laws, we make amendments to various laws which has a tremendous impact on the judiciary. Just let's also talk of 138 of the Negotiation Instruments Act. So despite there being a committee headed by Justice Jagannath Rao, uh, government after government has not actually done anything because whenever a bill is introduced, a statement has to be made on the judicial impact. And unfortunately, that is not happening. Do you know why and why, what, is, what is preventing that from happening? She, uh problem is this. I think in the Consumer Protection Act, this point was raised in the Supreme Court that the judicial impact uh, assessment was not made. Now, so far as uh, the Constitution is concerned, the judiciary cannot in any manner intrude upon the proceedings in the Parliament or the legislature. And therefore, so far as the four walls of the House are concerned, it is purely the business of the House. And if the manner of the matter of this nature has to be brought in in regard to legislation, which requires Parliament under orders of the Supreme Court to do a particular act, that, according to the separation of powers, is not permissible. Therefore, so far as Parliament is concerned, you may not expect them to blindly accept this. And therefore, so far as this is concerned, perhaps they believe that there is an article in the Constitution, I can't tell you the, the number straight away, the particular article, which says that the proceedings of the Parliament are, cannot be the subject matter of any judicial uh, intervention. The, judici the Parliament could well believe, and I have not gone into that with uh, any legislator or any minister or anything like that, that so far as this is concerned, this is not nothing. They can advise, they can recommend, but it's left to us to decide as to whether we will accept it or not and implement it. Perhaps that may be the reason. I am not sure. No, I think, uh, yeah. Datar wants to add. No, I think you're right, uh, Justice Bulijar, because we had the same problem when RERA was introduced. And we know that they, when the RERA was introduced, there were so many cases, they had no idea how many, in Noida alone, some 60,000 cases were there. And then Correct. in Maharashtra, we had some other IS officer temporarily dealing with. So they should have perhaps anticipated how many will come before the RERA tribunal. And we had a lot of problems in the No, and we're talking at all levels of court. Yes. So, you know, with this whole hierarchy of the judiciary, at every level we are going to create, a, like every time we create a tribunal, sir, a 226 jurisdiction is immediately invoked against interim orders. In fact, the Supreme Court is itself overburdened with direct appeals from AFT. So the Supreme Court has had to say, no, don't come directly to the Supreme Court, go to the High Court. No, it's been referred to three judges. No, but as of now, because of 226 being widely interpreted, from many orders of the tribunals, 226 is involved. So because AFT, if you look at 227, there is a proviso which says, no matter relating to the armed forces. Similarly, 136 is also a proviso, no matter relating to the armed but forces. But I'm generally saying, therefore, every therefore, time... Therefore, I had told uh, Justice Bobley yes. when he was a puny judge yes. that you cannot uh, look into the... You cannot direct them to go to the uh, High Court just to relieve the Supreme Court of what Parliament has done. And But I think it's time that, uh, so far as the Supreme Court is concerned, it's deprived of most of its uh, uh, matters because there were 90 cases of pensioners of armed forces pending in the Supreme Court because of the direct appeal. And therefore, when he referred it to three judges, I told him, please uh, have a special bench constituted for the purpose of deciding these 90 yeah. cases. And now, Justice Nagesh Rao complained to me once, and I appeared before him, that <laughs> on account of you, the 90 cases have been dumped on me. But they managed to dispose of the whole of it very swiftly. 
this is a problem. Okay. Just we can take uh, one more question. I have a person standing there asking me to end this. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Venugopal and uh, Mr. Datar for accepting our invitation and then uh, sharing your views on uh, very important topics pertaining to constitutional perspectives and vision. And uh, I thank all, you, all of you for your patience. Thank you.